All right. Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome to Fate's Wide Wheel. I'm Sam. I'm Dennis. And we are here this week. Dennis, we did the damn thing. We did the thing. We did the thing. <laughs> that was like um, the long shot thing when we started right? this over five years ago. It is. It has been uh, a long road getting here from, from there, there to from here. there to here. <laughs> ben, I don't have my uh, camera no, uh, <laughs> we are uh, incredibly excited to share with you our full uh, conversation with Deborah Bratt. Uh, I don't think uh -huh. we really need to say more than that for anybody that's listening to this podcast. You probably just want to fast forward through all this stuff and get right to that conversation. Um, but uh, of course, you know, we've got a few things we want to chat about before we, we get there. Uh, I'll just sum it up in, in one word and say amazing. Uh -huh. um, you know, what, what an incredible opportunity it was uh, for us and, and, and just so much fun to be able to uh, talk with her, to learn from her. Um, yeah, there were a couple of moments where, you know, I asked a question and her response was not necessarily what I expected. And it just felt mm -hmm. profound, you know, mm -hmm. even if it was a short answer, like it just the way it was just sort of like, Sure. Learn something, you know, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was really cool. You know, it was cool yeah. of her to share uh, to share herself uh, with us and, 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 and by proxy, you know, all of you listening. So um, yeah. thank you so much for for tuning in. And thank you so much to Deborah for uh, sharing that with us and giving uh, us her time, because it was a really incredible experience. It was fantastic. I feel like there were there were a couple of times like, oh, oh, we're like we could like just totally go away from Quantum Leap and just talk about like other esoteric mm -hmm. i mean like quantum leap themed stuff but like go away from the show like uh and then sure. like, oh but yeah rain it rain it back in because this is what a anyway um it was fantastic it was a blast it was a lot of fun uh we're putting this out a little bit later because one um the the series they push back family style a week and i don't know like all the reasons behind it but now when the show comes back we're gonna have six straight episodes all the way up through the season finale which is awesome yeah also because with our I schedule so. working out this week we didn't have a chance to get together and and record something and we were just gonna do like a pre-recorded thing where you do a thing and i do a thing but i was, I was like no i want to get together because it seems weird because like this is the thing that we've been wanting to do the entire podcast it would just seem weird to just put <laughs> right. kind of like kind of like impersonal bumpers around on the either end so just want to get together and do like uh you know, like the, like like the in-person introduction and then and then we'll bring around and wrap it up and then next week we'll be back for family style. And then we have to, we're going to have to like do some exercises and calisthenics because yeah, next, week, next six weeks after that, it's all the way through all the yeah. way through to the end. Yeah. And it's, it's great because there's, there's just a lot of variables and a lot of unknowns right now. And, uh, you know, I'll just say that we're like, we have no idea if we're going to have any other guests on, you know, uh, in, in that time, it, it might just be the two of us talking about the episodes, like the old days. Um, um, it, it maybe not, who knows what will happen in between then. We don't, we, but we don't have anything, uh, lined up at this point. And, uh, I'm just so looking forward to getting, you know, to experience, uh, what they have in store for us for these next six episodes. I mean, there's stuff, you know, there's stuff that, 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 we've been privy to for, for one reason or another that we've seen here or there. Um, and so, I, I mean, I know some of what's coming, but uh, the wonderful thing is, is I know so little about the last like two episodes of the season and I, and, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, and here's the thing. Wonderful I'll... to just, just let them hit us. Yeah, I'll repeat this again when we get to family style, but yeah, we got a couple of uh, doozies from a couple different sources, uh, not even towards the end of the season, but also where season two is going as far as, as like the direction they're heading. And the last time that you and I talked, I was like, you know what? No more. That's it. You, yeah. you get all the spoilers. Yeah. You keep them from me. I'm putting up a firewall. <laughs> I, want, I want nothing, nothing, nothing. Do you hear me? Aside, yeah. aside like, from the screeners, don't tell me anything. aside from the screeners, I do not want to know anything else. So if you're one yeah. of the people who's, who's Speaking slipping of which, us stuff, I, I'm, I'm going to say, if you're one of the people who's slipping <laughs> us stuff and you're listening to this episode right now, st send it directly to Sam, send it to his email, text message him, <laughs> leave me out of it. I want, I want no part of it anymore. <laughs> I want to come in as cold as possible. Anyway, speaking of which. 
Which, you know, what? I'll, I'll, before I get to the screeners thing, uh, I'll say I, I think it's really cool because one of the things that you even said is like, I think it'll give us a, a neat opportunity for perspective on, on the series, mm -hmm. you know, because both of us will be coming from it from sort of a different context, right? Because there are, like I said, there are certain things that, you know, have just kind of come our way from, you know, one source or another. And, 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 and yeah, there's stuff that I, I know that there's stuff that I know that I haven't shared with you due to that. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm going to come at some of this stuff, knowing these little tidbits here and there, and you're going to come at stuff not knowing anything. And, and so when we do get together to talk, you know, I think that that could be kind of interesting, just, you know, even for me to just kind of be like, oh, what's this is reaction going to be to this? Yeah. Um, but the, the on the other side of that, the screener, it is worth noting that at the time that we recorded uh, our conversation with Deborah, we had not yet seen Family Style, and that still holds true. Um, the screener has not yet been released for Family Style. Um, we anticipate that we'll probably get it, you know, later in the week, uh, uh, closer to the episode, sort of the regular time that we would get it, in spite of there yeah. having been this, you know, this two week break. Um, but uh, uh, not that it really mattered. I, I think our, our conversation, I mean, the thing is, is that we, again, we had wanted to talk to Deborah since day one, since we started this podcast, that was like a goal, you know, mm. a, a bucket list sort of thing, if you will. And uh, we could have kept talking to her uh, about things that had nothing to do whatsoever with the revival. Uh, we did talk about the revival, um, obviously, and she had a lot of lovely things to say about it and lovely things to say about the people that work on the show as well. Um, so it's not that, that, that we didn't include that. Uh, it's just obvious that we could have talked about stuff with her that, you know, that would not have included it. Um, but yeah, so for what it's worth, we don't talk much about family style just because we hadn't seen it yet and we didn't want necessarily Deborah to have to spoil anything. Plus, we kind of anticipated that this would be released before stamp family style would air anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So we didn't want to release anything that would that would have spoilers. So that's yeah. just, just so everyone knows uh, before you listen, you don't have to worry about spoilers for family style because we don't really talk about it um, yeah. that much at all. But um, and what we do talk about is, is spoiler free. Um, so, yeah, I guess yeah. Uh, that's out of the way. Yeah. Should we thank some people? Yeah. Thank some people, and then let's get into it here. So let's uh, yeah, let's go right. here. I want to thank uh, Al's Place, Sleep Fan Site, Bourbon and Board Games, Carolyn, Cosplay Dad, Joanne Bartlett, Dana Bias, Rich Bork, Kevin, Kevin Butcher, Carol Davis, Dex Lower, Dermot Devlin, Barry Donovan, Brian Dreadbull, Troy Evers, Larry Ganey, Jason Geis, Michelle Hoffman, Amy Holtkamp, Lori Johnson, Bess A. Corey, Lady Eternal, Rob Nunn, oddly specific with Audra, Christopher Redman, Adrian Saul, Karen Saxon, Jerry Seward, Mike Stouffer, Heather Strabiak, Damon Sugamelli, Larry Trujillo, Stuart Williams, Joe Wilson, our anonymous donors, and as always, a special shout out to Jessica Conger and Betsy Freimeyer, our spouses who provide vital child care while we record the show. If you would like to become a, a patron, <laughs> there are a couple different ways. You can do through uh, monthly through patreon.com slash fateswidewheel or a one-time donation at buymeacoffee.com slash fates wide wheel. That'll get you access to all of the extras right now. Pretty much those are our live watch parties on Monday nights. Uh, anything else that we can, we release uh, a little bit before. So you get early access to that beforehand. Uh, and I know that you always, you know, like the, you know, to say your words about, you know, make sure you're giving back to your community first before you come back to us. Another thing I want to say, because we've had this on the website, we haven't put this out there, but uh, a couple people have taken advantage of it recently. Um, and it is on our website. If you would like access to our, to our patron stuff, but you are not in a place where you can financially support us, there is a form on our website where you can fill it out and you will get access to all of the stuff, the patrons, you do the watch parties, anything extra that we release, uh, just go to fateswidewheel.com slash patron, not Patreon, patron, fateswidewheel.com slash patron. There's a form at the bottom of the page. You fill that out. I'll get an email and then you will get added to, to the email list to get all of the, all of the patron stuff. Fantastic. I love that. Um, yeah. And, and like Dennis said, I always, you know, like to say that obviously if you can give back to your community in any way, you know, do that first, uh, uh put right what once went wrong. Um, you know, be a, be a good leaper, a good fellow traveler. And, uh, we've certainly name checked some causes, uh, before here on the podcast, including like the Trevor project or doctors without borders. Uh, but there are many, 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 many more out there, um, that could use your help and uh, they could just be in your own backyard. So, um, you know, help out when and where you can. And then after all that, you still want to, uh, make sure that, that we can, 
and keep the lights on. Uh, we are absolutely indebted to you. Um, and we really appreciate it. Uh, it. It's been something that I have certainly tried not to take for granted at all uh, along this journey because it's sometimes I'm just sort of like, wow, if people still do that. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and we are very grateful for it. And, and it is helping because there are ways that we've been able to, um, you know, to use it to improve things already. Um, and we're going to continue doing that as we go forward. Um, and as soon as, uh, my family and I get into a, a, you know, our own home, our own place, our, with, with my own setup and, and, and everything, uh, we'll see what else we can do. So thank you all so much. Uh, really, you know, and, and, and again, just thank you for listening. Um, thank you for hitting that download button, subscribe button, leaving us a review. Uh, it helps and we really genuinely appreciate it. And to echo Dennis's comments, uh, yes, thank you to our spouses. Um, because I, I know, you know, today is a great example of, of just, uh, you know, Jessica, just doing everything around here, uh-huh. um, yep. and, uh, giving me a chance to, to catch up on some stuff and do some things. Um, you know, obviously at the point at time we're recording kiddos are in bed uh, uh and she's getting a well 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 deserved break um uh, herself so uh, uh even a break from me uh, <laughs> but uh, but you know it's uh uh it, we, we are we're we're two we're two tired dads uh who are forever grateful to uh the the wonderful partners that, that put up with us um uh, both of us, both of us married up. Let's, let's be honest here. That's right, yes, um, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yep. um, no, uh, anyway, um, yeah, gratitude yeah. is definitely the word of the day. Uh, I cannot even begin to express the gratitude that we have, um, in our hearts and our minds for Deborah Pratt. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, this is something that, that we talked a little bit about in the interview. Uh, and it's something we've talked about on the show many, many times before going back, you know, five plus years. And that is that this show really genuinely helped to define who we are uh, as people mm. and define our moral compass um, and but, uh... taught us so much. And, you know, one of the main reasons for that is indeed Deborah Pratt. And, yeah. you know, to have her on the show was just a, a privilege. Yeah. Well, when I shared your Twitter post on my personal page, I said, you, you know, Quantum Leap has been basically part of my personal brand since seventh grade. So, so yeah, this is this is a big deal, big deal. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you are listening to this episode, you you know who Deborah Pratt is. But uh, to do our due diligence as podcast hosts, we have a bio that we're gonna we're gonna read out for you here, and then we'll toss it to our interview. Uh, and then stick around afterwards. Like we'll do a little housekeeping. We'll do some, you know, goodbyes, whatever to ease you out in case you're, you know, you are still listening and <laughs> as you are driving down on your commute or you're falling asleep to us at night. However, wherever you, where you take us, where you listen and watch us on YouTube, whatever. Well, that's a nice thought here. actually. Yeah. 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 All right. Here we go. I'm talking uh, somebody to sleep. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Nice. All right. Uh, I feel silly even doing this because, you know, but, you know, here we go. Uh, Deborah M. Pratt is an American director, writer, television, executive producer and actress. She was executive producer of The Net for USA Network, co-executive producer and head writer on the iconic NBC series Quantum Leap and Tequila and Benetti for CBS. She wrote for multiple television series, including Quantum Leap, Magnum P.I., The Pretender and Airwolf. She made her directorial debut with Cora Unashamed for the BBC, PBS, and Masterpiece Theatres, The American Collection. She is a five-time Emmy nominee, a Golden Globe nominee, a recipient of the Lillian Gish Award from Women in Film, the Angel Award, the Golden Block Award, and six and the six BEN Award. I apologize if I'm not getting that right. From the award-winning series Quantum Leap to the internationally acclaimed Masterpiece Theatres, Cora unashamed and on the new series she is of course executive producer and as she says in our interview at the first read through the first episode she announced herself as keeper of the lore for the new show so without any further ado here's our interview with deborah pratt deborah welcome to the show thank you very very much it's a pleasure to be here (laughs) it's so wonderful to have you here thank you uh, you guys have been really good. I love that you've embraced, you know, the new show and, um, and it's had a lot of people. It's very exciting mm-hmm. uh, to see it finally be reborn and this kind of new format. God, they get to do so much more action than we got. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> 
uh, yeah, so. Well, it, you know, it's funny. One of the things that I wanted to ask you, actually, uh, it, it, now that you've especially had the chance to direct an episode, but especially with being on set as much as you have been, according to you know pictures that we've seen and what other people have told us, um, what's it like to see the show kind of transform from being almost purely based around Sam's leaps and only seeing what was happening in the past with a couple of exceptions to now balancing the story and seeing stuff happening at the project as well as what's going on with Ben's leaps. I find it fascinating in the sense that and this is what I say to everybody at what I said 28 years ago to the network. I said, you know, uh, truthfully, if Star Trek can do nine spin-off series and nine major motion pictures, why can't we? And now I look at Star Wars, who has the Star Wars channel, same kind of thing, <laughs> and I'm saying, why not? So I, I'm, a, I'm fascinated with the, with the direction that um, Stephen Lillian and Brian um, Winbach took uh, with, with headquarters. You know, we just couldn't afford... We couldn't afford it back in the day. We went there occasionally, and it was usually kind of wild and funny and gushy and, you know, Al and whatnot. But um, they really have built a whole storyline. What I see as a big difference in not being trapped in the past with Sam mm -hmm. is we had so much more time to tell his story, to yeah. tell where he was, who he was with, who they were, um, and I missed that a little bit, but I felt like my major contribution was to keep the mythology. You know, as, as a matter of fact, I think in the first reading, I said, I'm Deborah Pratt, keeper of the lore. How can I help? <laughs> <laughs> um, to let me stay true to the mythology. And then, you know, and I've said to them, when you want to add other mythology, you know, just make sure it's grounded and doesn't veer too far from the show because I think our fans are so dedicated. They know stuff, you know, I, uh -huh. I rely on them. I, I was on some interview show and I said, Oh my, I don't remember exactly what that was. And all of a sudden, like the chat just blew up with people answering. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being my memory. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I, I, I love that. And I, and I think that that's something that, you know, has come through when we've spoken to other people, um, you know, sort of your stewardship of the show, you know, of the mythology of, you know, keeping the, the spirit alive in so many ways, especially in the time, you know, from when it stopped airing to the, the continuation, the revival beginning to air um, has been very evident. And I can even remember uh, about a year and a half ago, I think it was, when you put out there that there were conversations happening and that it was possible and they needed to know that we wanted it. And I'm just curious at that particular point in time, you know, where where were things? I mean, obviously, we know where they ended up, right? We we, we got the pilot, we got the, the series order, and now we're going to get yeah. a season two. But at the time that you kind of wrote that, was it just those very, very beginnings of, of conversations? Or did you kind of have a feeling that it could happen? It could really, really happen this time? Because obviously, there'd been talk before. Um, right. So yeah, so I'm curious what your feeling was, you know, a year and a half ago, especially compared to those other times when it might have happened or almost happened. Well, I think once the studio called, it was real. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so people are talking and people are sharing ideas and this could happen, this could happen. But until Universal calls and NBC is interested, it's not real. Yeah. And they were then at that point, um, they said, okay, this looks like it's happening. We're starting to cast. And I said, okay, at this time I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, I think you need that validation from the people that that hold the rights to make it happen. And so, you know, Don and I both said, OK, this looks like a good group of people. Uh, Martin uh, Giro is a fabulous producer, writer, as is Dean um, Jagarius and I felt like, oh, my God, we really have a good team of people, you know, coming to the table. And then when they started talking about casting and they said, you know, um, 
Stephen and, and Brian want to have magic as a central character. And I just went, Ernie Hudson. That's awesome. That's it. I mean, I, I just feel like they, they made a great choice in those folks. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know, because like when those conversations were happening, Peacock as a streaming platform was just coming on. And I think both Sam and I assumed that the show would just go straight to Peacock because like after 30 years of, of being, you hear things like people in the business, like didn't think that quantum leap was a marketable title. Was it ever planned for it to go straight to Peacock? And then they're like, Oh, this is really good. It's going to NBC. Or do you know like what those conversations were like? I, I don't, I mean, Martin would be the person to, to really talk sure. about, uh, and it or Steve and, and, um, Brian, Stephen and Brian, um, but I think because it was an NBC show and NBC timing wise was losing a lot of their shows, they needed mm -hmm. a show that had an, a built in audience. Sure. You know, that's a rarity in television. You know, uh, Harry Potter became a, a book phenomenon before it ever became a series of motion pictures. So to have an existing IP that has a dedicated fan base, it's never gone away. I mean, you, we did we did three conventions when the show was on the air. And then when the show went off the air, the fans kept the conventions going. So I think there was either seven or eight years of, of fan conventions that had I been able to bring the show back um, then, I think really would have opened some, some real doors as well. But, you know, things have to happen in their time. Uh, Sure. And and I think and I say this uh, and I really want to be heartfelt about it in the sense that the world needs Quantum Leap to come back right now. Mm. Yeah, it's a show that's not on TV. It's about hope. It's about somebody coming into your life and making it better. And I don't think that's anywhere on TV. Yeah. So so with the world the way it is and disjointed the topics being pushed uh under the mat under the guise of critical race theory it's not theory it's history uh, stop trying yeah. to change it yeah. right <laughs> and, and and i think we're gonna get to tell more of those shows that made quantum leap quantum leap i mean the first time around uh, we did the first season and i remember I wrote uh, Star Crossed and then turned around and said, I want to write Sam leaping into a, a black man. And everybody went, Oh, no, that's your three, that's your three, that's your three. And I went, <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's now. This is what the show can do. Let's show them what they can do. And thank Brandon Tartikoff, visionary that he was at that time. Mm -hmm. He went, She's right. She's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I got to write. Um, him as a woman in that I got to write him as black and, and the show blew up. It really did because what we discovered, which was so cool. Um, one of the, uh, one of Don's assistants, Harriet Margolis, God rest her soul. Well, now you have to remember this was 1989 computers were just kind of coming into the workplace. As a matter of fact, I had to fight with Don saying no more typewriters. We're getting computers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep my mm. typewriter until I, until I showed him <laughs> how you could get it. And then he went, oh, yeah, I got this. Harriet <laughs> <laughs> sure. came in and said the next day, you got to check this out. I found these people in things called chat rooms. And it was like mm -hmm. a water cooler. And people would get, so we started going into the chat rooms after the show was, you know, aired and listening to what people liked, listening to what they thought, listening to where the conversation was, where somebody might not have agreed with somebody else about, you know, a political um, uh, turn that the, the, the show had taken, but they talked. This is the other thing mm. that's not happening in this mm. world right now. And so if Quantum Leap can bring that back as well, you know, I got chills just just thinking about all the mm -hmm. division in this country alone, but in the world, it's a great opportunity um, because what people don't understand is the show's never gone off the air ever. Mm -hmm. 
And right. I get people of all ages to say, oh, my God, I love Quantum Leap. I watched it with my parents or I watched it with my sister or my go- our grandparents. And then we would just like get together and we would talk about it. My parents would talk about the history that they experienced at that time. Or my grandparents would talk about the history they experienced about civil rights, about women's rights. And I, that to me was, was the soul of the show. Absolutely. We, you know, uh, so many questions. You answered a couple that I was going to ask without me even asking them. Um, but we we talked to Shakina last week uh, about Let Them Play. And one of the things that Dennis mentioned, and he compared it favorably to Color of Truth, uh, appropriately enough. And I saw photos of you at the, the red carpet event that they had for Let Them Play. And so I'm curious, you know, b- about your thoughts on the parallels between those two episodes. And e- even more so, on you know quantum leap being that empathy engine and and being able to not only provide us with social commentary but hopefully move us in certain ways at that emotional level you know beyond being kind of like a political message and the importance of that um today you know, as, as you've already said but expand on that a little bit if you don't mind uh sure i got secure script and i had seen the the beats on it and i went oh yeah okay the network is loosening up a little bit and I, read the script and I cried and I picked up the phone and I called her and I said, Shakira, this is the first show that to me is a true quantum leap. Yeah. It, it has what I call the four hearts uh, the four H's. It has heart, hope, history, and hope, heart, hope, mm-hmm. history, and humor. Mm-hmm. You know, yes, when, when totally. Shakira got up and did that whole thing with the mirror and the poem where, where yeah. magic is getting the fact that, oh, my God, she was leapt into. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, and that to me is the balance of the show. And it's harder to do when you're when you're deep in headquarters. Um, but thank God for Ian. They have a great sense <laughs> of humor. And, mm. You know, Ian is a little bit of a kick of Al you know, the avant-garde clothing and they are, um, they're funny, you know, it's an emergency. But yeah, so I called her and I said, you brought me to tears. And that to Mm. me as somebody who's, you know, is a, was a creator of this world. The fact that she moved me was important to me. Yeah. And I think we're getting more of that. And truthfully, everybody that's seen um, the episode I directed that Adrita um, uh, wrote has said they love this episode. This is their favorite episode, mm. you know, because mm. it's about it's about family. It's about food. Oh, my God. It was like so much fun when I read the script. I went, oh, my God, I get to I get to do <laughs> chef and the bear. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's so cool i you know i'm curious it, we, we actually asked shakita about directing like the basketball stuff but like directing you know, coming into the director's chair and 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 especially on something that you've been so involved with um i'm curious what that felt like but even furthermore what's it like directing those kitchen scenes because they're like action scenes, basically. Like, just, and I'm just talking from the right. leap in and and, and uh, uh, the trailer because we haven't actually seen it yet. But it, it feels like there's a lot that's got to go into that. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, we usually have eight days on a show, and we got backed up because of COVID and things like that. And they mm-hmm. came to me and they said, "Okay, you get seven days." And I went, "Oh what? wow, <laughs> okay." Uh, <laughs> I, I, I need three cameras, four on the big action day. Uh, got it. And then I decided to do as much handheld as I could. Oh, cool. And once we, you know, they wanted, they took us to two kitchens to scout. And one of them was like high end, brand new, you know, all the bells and whistles. And then the other one was this funky, a little bit greasy, dirty kitchen. <laughs> and I went, yeah. oh, it's this way. <laughs> and um, it, 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 it reflected for me, here's a fa- an immigrant family that's come to the United States that is making their dream come true. And I mean, I, I, I ask all the viewers on that show to, to go to Twitter or to, 
to come to, uh, you know, hashtag quantum leap, hashtag NBC universal, hashtag um, family style, all those hashtags, but put in something about how food and family have affected your life. Share with mm. me. And that's the water cooler thing that I'm, I'm personally looking for because I believe that the, I believe that this is an interactive show. Uh -huh. Quantum Leap is an interactive show. And the first show that came on, the pilot, the, the, the pilot that came on, I said to everybody at seven o'clock, because we were on the set, let's go on Twitter and see what's happening. And everybody went, oh, no, no, no. It's so negative. It's so dark. I said, not Quantum Leap. <laughs> the fans <laughs> love this show and it's going to blow your mind. And people were like, uh, um, Chris was directing the Halloween episode and he goes, mm. I have never seen this kind of love for a show on any show mm. that I've ever done. I said, just talk to them. These are good mm. people who care, who enjoy good entertainment. And, um, and from then on, then all of a sudden, you know, there was like, <laughs> NBC was like, what? <laughs> well, you guys for 28 years. Bring the show back. <laughs> so we, so, you know, I, I, I love hearing that because one of the things that we've experienced and certainly with Let Them Play, because it was something that I wasn't quite sure. I, I wasn't sure exactly what the response would be. I didn't know what we would see. And overwhelmingly, it's been a lot of joy, a lot of hope. A, you know, people have been moved by it, which is so which is something that I'm you know grateful for on in, in, in a personal level. But like the number of sort of hateful or bigoted messages that that we received i mean it's so far outweighed by all the positives and i i think that that's something that the fandom has really rallied around the show especially as it's gone on i'm curious as to what you would say to the people you know to the naysayers to some of the people that have had criticisms about the show especially those that might just want it to be a regurgitation of the original series of what, you know, what was done 30 years ago, as opposed to what's being done now. Well, you know, I think people are allowed their opinion, but, but again, it's the water cooler. It, it initiates a conversation, even with yourself. I remember looking at um, Twitter and some guy went, nope, you know, women's sports should be women's sports played by women. And that's all he said. And my, my first thought was to, except for it's really hard. I got to admit it. It's really hard for me to watch the show and tweet. I got to figure out how to do yeah. that work for me. Mm -hmm. um, but the point was he watched it. He watched mm -hmm. it. Uh -huh. So, you know, we all have questions about the change in society and the change in our um, in in our destiny as a as a species. We are we're we're on the verge of either evolving or devolving right now. You know, as a futurist, I completely believe that we're in hard times, no question, and if we don't kind of unify and get it together and start, start, start talking to each other, we're going to de-evolve versus mm -hmm. if we come together and start communicating and start trying to figure out and understand what's happening, uh, we can actually evolve as a species, which we better do quickly because AI is, they're biting at uh -huh. our, our tails. <laughs> <laughs> So we really need to understand who we are and what we want uh, because with singularity heading our way, I think we have to be ready and we have to be unified uh, or we won't, we won't have the world that we want. And, and I think quantum leap represents a lot of that um, conversation at least a conversation mm -hmm. that we need to start having. What are the morals behind AI? What are the laws mm. behind AI? Um, and we haven't even figured out what are the morals and the laws about, you know, mm -hmm. getting pulled over by the police. 
if you're mm -hmm. living while black. <laughs> yeah, um, sure. And so I think those are the stories that need to be talked about from today's sensibility. And that's what Al, you know, Dean Stockwell, God rest his soul, was so incredibly mm -hmm. good at because when I, when I had Sam leap into a black man, he had experience in the civil rights and he talked to us about his experience and I wove it into the, the fiber of the show. Mm. So mm. it was really his experience that I was bringing into the storytelling. And I think it made it so real. And here we are 30 years later and we're still kind of having the same conversation. So it needs to be had again. Yeah. And um, we need to stop being afraid. Absolutely. I'm, I just want to say before you jump to your next question, Sam, I just want to make a comment. Like, I'm really fascinated. I love knowing that you pulled in Dean's experience for that, because like one criticism I have heard of Color of Truth is and like more like broadly, like the series in general is like Al has so many different experiences and like he's pulling these things in. And how could Al have all these experiences? And specifically with Color of Truth. I've heard some people criticize the episode, like it's a stretch that for Al would have had that information. So I love the fact that in real life, that information came from the actor who played him. Just remember, he lived in that period. Yeah. yeah. And he was politically active mm -hmm. and he cared. And he knew people that surprised me who he knew. And he, <laughs> you know, he marched, he, he stood by his beliefs. So yeah, exactly. Fantastic. This is, uh, I just thought of this question and, you know, feel free to not answer it because, you know, I don't want you to necessarily speak for him, but you, obviously you knew him very well. Do you think that at some point, just because knowing a little bit about his history, that he felt maybe a little defeated and that's one of the reasons why he did pull back? Because obviously like, you know, marching and being involved the late fifties and the early sixties and then kind of like, you know, dropping out and going into the Topanga Hills and the Canyon and, you know, just kind of living that lifestyle before he got back into into film and television again do you think that he he felt he saw kind of the writing on the wall that you know we've done all of this work and now you know and and now they're they're you know they're killing people they're you know they're they're assassinating mlk they're you know we're we're, we're finding ourselves maybe feeling a little bit defeated and he needed to take a break before he could come back and do you think that the show because uh, there are so there's so much of him woven into the show like you say with color of truth in particular his environmental stance do you think that that rejuvenated his his hope a little bit or do you think that's something that he just always had and never lost that's an interesting question um i talked to dean about why he disappeared mm -hmm. and you remember he was a child star right he was on broadway at five years old he was um a, a major movie star with mgm i think at seven and oh i'll tell you a dean stockwell story and then <laughs> remind me where where we are now sure and that was um i, I had written another mother and my mm -hmm. daughter brian who was four I wrote her a part because I thought, oh, come see what mommy and daddy do and you can hang on the set. And she learned her little lines and she's <laughs> on the set and they're brushing her hair. And Dean walks in. He met her. Both Scott and Dean had met her, you know, because I brought her down to the set. And um, he sees her sitting, you know, waiting for him to come over to do this scene with. And he looks at me and he goes, why, why is she here? And I went, oh, I, mommy and daddy wrote, uh, you know, uh, do the show. And I wanted to see and I wanted to write her a part. And. He looked at me and kind of got in my face and went, do you need the money? And I mm. went, what? <laughs> he said, do you need the money? Because if you don't need the money, do not take away her childhood. And I saw mm. 50 years of a child star who supported his family. And I went, uh, okay. <laughs> and after <laughs> I got all these phone calls for people who wanted her to be in other um, movies and shows and everything. And I went, no. Mm. No. Mm -hmm. I said, if she wants to get back into this on her own, you know, she did some little things. The Olsen twins were our neighbors. So they hung out <laughs> and they went mm. to high school together. Um, so I think she did an Olsen twin movie and they wanted her to do more because she was good. And I went, nope. Mm. I said, she'll, she'll find her way back. But I wanted her to have a whole, a whole life. Mm -hmm. And Dean told me, going back to what we were originally talking about, Dean told me that after he did... Oh God, what was the name of the movie? 
where he played the brothers that murdered this kid. Oh, uh, not compulsion. Was it com no? Um, I want to say that yes. Was it compulsion? compulsion. Okay. Right. Yeah, I can't. The fans come in. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. <laughs> so he was 21 at that point, and he couldn't get arrested. Could not get a job to save his life. Mm. And he ended up bumping around Hollywood and then moved to Texas and became a real estate agent. Oh, wow. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's in Texas and uh, his good buddy. Oh, shoot. I'm so bad at names. Who did Blue Velvet? Dennis Hopper. Oh, Dennis uh, yeah. Not Dennis Harry Hopper. Harry Dean Stanton. Uh, David Lynch directed it. David Lynch. Uh, David okay, Lynch. Okay, okay. What are you doing here? Come be in my movie. <laughs> and he did that. And then from that, he did uh, Married, Married to the Mob, I think. Uh -huh. And that's where we found him. Yeah. And he walked into audition with Scott. And the chemistry ignited the room between the two of them. There was no doubt this was Sam and Al. No yeah. doubt at all. So I think he... He got rejected by the Hollywood community, as good an actor right. as he was, as young as he was. Transitioning from child star to adult star is probably one of the hardest things, you know, people sure. do, um, have to do. And he, he was so grateful for the job and professional. He was a dream. He and Scott both were a dream to come to work <laughs> with every day. And they played with each other. The set was joyous. And when I met, you know, um, Raymond Lee and Caitlin Bassett and um, Mason and um, Nanrissa, I said, especially to Ben, I said, you're number one, the first, you know, Asian American number one ever in history. I said, but the, the tenor, the tone of this set is on you. If you walk in here, and you've had a bad day and you don't want to talk to anybody, the whole energy will be affected by everybody on this set. But if you walk in and go, hey, everybody, new day, let's get started. Oh, hey, so-and-so, how's your mom doing? Oh, the baby, did the baby come? And you know, <laughs> family and he and all of them nailed it. We, you know, we talked, we talked to each other no matter what you do, if you're a PA or if you're show running, everybody's part of this family. And I think the first day of shooting, I got donuts and coffee for <laughs> everybody. And I had a sign, I didn't have my signs with me. Um, I had uh, signs made up, stage 40. These were brand new stages. I don't think Universal's built new stages in 75 years. And they gave us these two brand new stages. One I'm sure is already haunted because you know, <laughs> and the light up in the, you know, in the rafters will just flash and go on and everybody goes, okay, wait a minute. We can't do that. <laughs> yeah. we can't figure out why or what's happening. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen all the time. Yeah. So I think we got a ghost in, in I think 41 stage. Four. <laughs> Um, I, one of the things that I wanted to uh, go back to real quick is, you know, you mentioned pitching color of truth and about how it was met with some resistance. And it's like, we got to wait to do that. Um, being in the position that you were in, you know, as a, as a woman, as a person of color, it's 1989 and you're, you're in this room, you're working with these people. Did you feel like you had to work harder? You had to pitch harder than everybody else? Or do you feel like, you know, that, that, that it was just kind of like the fidelity to the system, perhaps, you know, to, to trying to kind of like figure out what was going to make the show successful as opposed to any resistance that was directed at you. There was some resistance that was directed at me, but truthfully, I quantumly would have never gotten made had it not been for Don Belisario. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he was white, males, successful, had yeah. Magnum right. PI Air, had done Airwolf. Right. And, you know, he said to me, and at that point I was an actor who was just starting to write. I had done a couple of episodes of Magnum. I had written a couple of episodes. I mean, I'd written a couple of episodes of Magnum, written a couple of episodes or one episode for, for, um, Airwolf. 
-hmm. And he, he said, let me teach you how to be an executive producer and a creator in a town that doesn't see you. Mm. And I thought, okay, <laughs> you know, and we made a trade off. And, um, when I said, I have this idea and, um, it's pretty quirky and pretty weird. He kept looking at me like I was from another planet. And then <laughs> in the middle of the night said, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Cause I said, time and space is limited. So a, th a fourth person can't jump into the room with the three of us. Somebody has got to get knocked out. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. way quantum particles work is once they come together, clash together, they're always connected. And so you share history, but the energy of who that person is stays in place. And other than children under five and animals who see the truth of who you are, which is why I wrote another mother, um, people around you believe the image that you project of yourself. So it was pretty mm. quirky idea. And when we went into Brandon Tartikoff's office to pitch it, he said, okay, there's something here it's really, this is really good, but I got to think about it. <laughs> so about two days later, he called and said, come back. Can you come back into the office? And yeah, you know, it was a major TV deal. <laughs> <laughs> he went into his office and he said, okay, pitch it to me again. And this I tell to, to writers because I thought it was the best learning experience I've ever had. Hmm. He said, pitch it to me like I'm six years old. Hmm. And then we did that. And they said, now pitch it to me like I'm 80. <laughs> and once we did that, he says, oh, okay, okay, okay. I gotta think about it, but let me call you. <laughs> 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 I went back three times because it was such a unique show. And he, and he said, I don't have anything to put with this, but I can't let it go. Uh, the, the idea of an anthology is scary. Yeah. Um, but I think the ability to tell, to do storytelling, that's not procedural. It's not a cop show. It's not a doctor show. It's not a lawyer show. Um, it's, it's got this mix of any story you ever want to do, you can do. And I said, that's exactly right. I'm sure we had said that like 10 times. He <laughs> <laughs> yeah. got it. And, um, and he said, green light, go write it. Let's do it. And uh, I'm glad I'm, I'm he very did. Proud of the show for that reason. <laughs> mm -hmm. And many more. But. Yeah. Well, you know, thinking about uh, the, the, the way that the show can tell so many different kinds of stories and that I, I feel like the revival initially, I think that there were some fans that were skeptical of it being able to do that still because of the way that we were intertwined with the, um, you know, this new sort of myth arc that the show has and going back to the project in the present day and would it still be able to do those things? And I think that certainly it didn't take long for that answer to be a resounding yes. Um, are there stories that you didn't necessarily get the chance to tell 30 years ago that you hope that the show gets to do today? Or do you think that it, because the show does sort of have to be, you know, rooted in the present in some ways with, you know, contextually with where we are now, although we certainly haven't gone as far as we possibly could have, as you mentioned earlier, um, are there, are, are there certain types of stories that you feel like maybe the door is closed on, or do you still think it's wide open for storytelling purposes? I think it's absolutely wide open for storytelling purposes, you know, um, and I've said Star Trek can do nine television spinoffs and nine motion pictures. <laughs> you know, I want, I want to bring Sam back. I want to bring Scott Bakula back yeah. in my yeah. major motion picture. He deserves that. He's a movie star. And um, I got some ideas that are pretty far. <laughs> and those stories and more could be told you know, with Sam, with the old style, a little bit of the old style of storytelling and then some, but it's a time travel show. So anything is possible. Yeah. We can go back mm -hmm. and change time any way we want. We can go forward and see what happens. So I think all those doors are open 
and you know, I'm sure, um, you know, Martin and Dean and the, and the writing staff, uh, are playing with a, a lot of those things, uh, but I can't share them or I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, well, okay. I, without sharing specifics, you know, Martin's on the record as having a very specific idea in mind for bringing Scott slash Sam back into the show for, you know, for an indeterminate amount of time. I'm curious, do you know what that plan is? And, um, are you, you know, is it, is it something that you're excited about? <laughs> I don't know what it is. Okay. I don't know what it is. You know, I don't, uh, there's certain things that because I want to do a motion picture, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sharing. Sure. And, <laughs> and it's okay that, that he's not sharing. Do you think that, you know, with the idea, because you are on the record and obviously you've alluded to it a couple of times in this interview, you, you're on the record as saying that there, the potential for a franchise certainly exists. Um, do you think that there's a way to kind of have these things exist in harmony in, in a way that, you know, if, if Martin wants to tell his Sam story and you want to tell your Sam story or, you know, bring Donna and Sammy Joe back or, you know, other characters uh, potentially back into the fold in some way, but not necessarily be on the revival is do you do you see a, a pathway to having all of those kind of coexist so that you can have a couple of TV shows or, you know, a movie or, you know, a, a special on Peacock every once in a while or something like that. Why not? All you have to do is <laughs> imagine it and make it happen. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I wrote 30 years ago, the trilogy and introduced Sammy Joe. I brought right. Donna back in the first season so that they could have a life together. And then uh, even though we couldn't get Terry Hatcher on the leap back, um, you know, he was with her for one night. So what happened that night? Uh -huh. Right. Right. You know, all that is there. All that lore is there. Yeah. Do you think, uh, you know, one of the things that I know that it's difficult sometimes for fandoms to get past uh, is maybe the... Um, it, it, it's not you're not ignoring it necessarily, but you might be saving it for later. Uh, bits of of the mythology, bits of the lore, the canon, whatever you want to call it, that aren't necessarily immediately addressed. Um, you know, the waiting room, for instance, was a big one for a long time with the revival. It's like, where's the waiting room? Where's the person at? You know, that sort of stuff. Um, do you look at it as you know? We need to keep the lore. We 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 have this stuff to draw from, but that you don't want it to get in the way of a good story. You don't want it to get in the way of the possibilities of doing more. Or do you think that remaining faithful to it is the, the priority? Um, I don't know how many episodes of how many various series of Star Trek have you seen? So, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, right. I mean, there's what right, yeah. and what's gone off. Um, but I feel as though, one of the reasons we stayed away from the waiting room, from the science, from the um, from the techie stuff, is because it's a show about people and heart. Mm -hmm. And truthfully, it's only a science fiction show when you leap in and when you leap out, and a hologram in between there. Every night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. think. If that's lost in, you know, in jargon and tech and all that other kind of stuff, I think a big hole will form. Uh, yeah. That's got to be filled by something, and maybe somebody will come up with a great idea to fill that hole. But um, I don't know that you need it. If you're telling a good story, if you care about the characters in the story, if you care about you know, Ben or Sam um, and what they're doing and who they're saving. I can't tell you how many letters I got from fans or people that I met with. I'll be in an executive pitch for something and the the executive will be sitting there and he'll be like 35 years old and he goes, okay, I have to just geek out for a minute. But I'm a huge quantum leap <laughs> fan. And one of them said the loveliest thing he said, I was going through some real hard time with my family and I, I kept wishing Sam would leap into my life and make things mm. right that had gone wrong. And that statement spoke volumes about the effect of this show, the effect 
of television and, and what it has on, on people, the fact that they can integrate it into their lives and use that hope to inspire them. And now he, this guy's an executive at a major studio. Sure. So as far as I'm concerned, Sam did leap into his life and make something right mm -hmm. that drove him on to be persistent and become the person that he became. For whatever reason, he didn't give up. I remember I got a letter from a mother and father, and they had a child on a cancer ward. Mm. And I'm trying to remember what the episode was. I can't remember. Anyway, uh, every, uh, we were on Thursday night. You know, we they moved us six times in five years. Mm, right. um, so we were on a Thursday night, and it was a ward. And every Thursday night, this whole ward of children's ward would come together and they would watch Quantum Leap. And the wow. doctors had pretty much told them, your daughter's not going to make it. She was seven or eight years old or 10, maybe. And um, a year after that show, I get this letter from this husband and wife. And they say, we want to thank you because we had given up hope. We were just going to wait for our daughter to, to die. And we watched this episode of quantum leap and whatever it was about, I can't remember the episode. It gave us hope. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't give up on her. And I want you to know that she's in full remission. She's, you know, however many years old. And I want to mm -hmm. thank you for that because wow. That inspiration um, helped us not just get through a, a hard time, but helped us believe in, again, the power of, of the spoken word. Sure. And that it can make a difference so much so that it could save a life. That's, yeah. you know, that's the, the passion of Quantum Leap and the heart of Quantum Leap. Um, that you can change history. Absolutely, and and, and yeah. I think that I think that. Sorry, I, I got a little emotional there. Um, I think that right. one of couldn't tell that story for years without crying. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think that you know one of the things, um, and I, I think Dennis feels similarly to me, and it's probably one of the reasons that brought us together to do this show um, five and a half years ago. But thank you for doing it. We both, <laughs> you're, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> we wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't for you. Um, is that we both have experienced that too. That, that, that idea that like, you know, wouldn't it be great if, you know, Sam could have left it and changed this one thing for us. And, and, you know, we've been moved by the show in, in many, many ways. And I think that the latest episode, let them play, you know, I genuinely got the feeling and a lot of people have shared this, that it was the type of show that really genuinely could save a life just, just by making people feel seen. Um, the new, you know, the revival, one of the beautiful things about it is the level of representation. You know, we've, we've literally seen episodes where there hasn't been one white male speaking role, you know, paging Dr. Song, for instance, you know, as you mentioned earlier, Raymond it being you know, the first Asian American male lead, you know, for, for a show of this nature. And, um, I think that that it's been incredibly important and it's, it's affected me. Um, and, you know, I'm curious for you, is this, is this something that you ever even imagined as a possibility, especially in 1989, you know, coming up with this idea? And I mean, obviously we adore Scott and Dean and they're so completely grateful for mm -hmm. them that tried to engage in revisionist history by any means. But do you think that this is something that you thought possible 30 plus years ago? No, it wasn't possible. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I went out pitching a story with just a female lead. You know, big sure. action, you know, movie, and I would pitch it, and the guy sitting on the other side of the desk would go, oh, my God, this is great, this is incredible, but when does the guy come and save her? Mm. i go, mm. well, he doesn't. She saves him. <laughs> um, I wrote a piece that a major, major um, film director, whose name, I don't know if I should mention or not, um, <laughs> read it and said, I've got to do this. And the, the, it was a historical piece with a black lead. Um, he, he is a, he is a phenomenal Renaissance man, but he's, he, and he is black. And 
the director said to me, yes, I absolutely want to do this, but you have to rewrite the lead character white. Hmm. And I went, I can't change history. This is a real person. And he went, what? Sure. I said, this is a real person. There is documented information, not just um, about him and his family and things. And he just hmm. went, that, I, don't, I don't know how to do it. I don't know a star that's out there that could open this movie. Mm. And so I recalled his last mega success. And I said, the star that you made on blah, 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 <laughs> was nobody I knew yeah. until you made him a star. So why can't you do that here? Mm. Uh, and he like totally backed off. So yeah, it's mm. been a challenge. Um, you know, even after Quantum Leap, I did the net and it was a, it was a fight every day to mm. to get my ideas through. And I have said, you know, a couple of times I just recently said I was honored by women in media. And I looked out to the to the people that were there and the audience that were there. And for the most part, I was speaking to the choir, as they say. <laughs> um, but there was a table full of execs and. I said, um, you guys have to understand that the, the ideas that come from other people, people of color, women, are just as important as white men. And you don't have to get them from white men to see what the vision is. And until you change that mindset, you're missing out on some fabulous stories. Yeah. So do they hear it? Um, I tell a story where uh, I, we, Michael Watkins, who was our DP, um, was moving on. And so I said, oh, let's get a woman DP. And um, I go looking to try and find one. And um, I find a list of four. And I walk, I'm walking on the set and I hear two, I don't know, they were grips or camera or whatever, camera. Um, I hear one of them say, what does she mean she wants a, a female DP? I'm not taking direction from a monkey. Mm. And I said, you're fired. Get off my set. And I felt like I had done the right thing in that. But mm. I got all mm. kinds of calls saying you can't fire someone for that. Well, that was 19... 89. I kind of think you could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You couldn't. Uh, and it was sad in that sense. And we didn't. And the only, you know, I was supposed to direct four times on the show. And because I was head writer and rewriting people and all this other kind of stuff, I ended up not being able to direct. And I brought in for um, each of those episodes, black women directors. And the only women that directed on Quantum Leap were Debbie Allen, who I gave two shows to, and Anita, what was her last name? She, she died too, oh my gosh. Um, that's it. And I have to tell you what a fight it was. Yeah. I, you know, one of the things that I, I, I hope you know, and, and I'm sure you do, but for the both of us, I mean, I can safely speak for Dennis on this one, is that, the show informed our moral compass in so many ways. And I think as a direct result, more often than not of episodes that you wrote, um, and, uh, you know, color of truth had a huge impact on, on me. Uh, I, I mean, I, I was eight years old when I first saw the episode and, uh, it, it informed so much about what I saw as, right or wrong as what I saw as possible as well. And, um, and, 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 and it, the show would continue to do that. Um, and, and I think the revival has done that too, and can, and do even more of that, uh, hopefully, you know, in the future, um, knowing that the show has been kind of that instrument of change. Um, do you feel like there are places where it's come up short? that there are, that there are places that you wished you would have been able to push a little bit further, um, or that you even wanted to push further, but for whatever reason, we're unable to. On the original show. Yeah. When we did black on white on fire, 
Sam leapt into a young black doctor in love with a white woman. Yeah. That show was pulled from the air in, I don't know how many states in the South, oh, because wow. it was considered a biracial relationship. And uh, I admire NBC for standing up for us. Um, but it was f frustrating. The truth yeah. was he was a white guy with a white girl on camera 99% of the time until he looked in his reflection. But I think it's the same uncomfortableness. And I worked very hard to talk about why those riots happened. Mm -hmm. um, and those marches happened. Um, I, there's, a, there's an amazing woman named Kimberly Jones and I don't know if you've seen her video. It was doing Black Lives Matter. And she, what I wanted to do was explain what brought those riots into fruition, why it was a tinderbox that went up that way. Yeah. And she talked about the Black Lives Matter um, marches kind of in the same way, but she did it brilliantly. She said, she said, well, I'm not going to do it justice. So go online and look up Kimberly Jones. But she said 400 years of monopoly. What if you had to play 400 mm. years of monopoly? Yep. Did you see this one? Monopoly. Mm, yeah. Yep. I, I've and seen it somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, nothing. You got to, had to give all your money to somebody else. And you did that for 400 years. And then for 50 years, they said, okay, you can kind of play, but then there's redlining and there's, and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can actually buy property and own something and, and, but you can be segregated and do it. And then the communities like Greenwood and um, Rosewood, um, Black Wall Street mm -hmm. did it and were successful. And the dollar hit five, six, seven times and everybody was successful from it. And then people got pissed and they came in and b bombed Greenwood. Um, they slaughtered people in both Greenwood and Rosewood. And, and in the end of it, she says, you ask why we burn our homes. And the truth is they're not our homes. We don't own anything. Mm -hmm. And her last line sent chills through me. And she said, you should be glad that we want equality and not revenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that I think is the big fear from the people that are pushing back so hard. They're thinking with their mentality that they would go for revenge. And mm -hmm. as a culture, the, if you look at what happened to apartheid, the forgiveness trials and all that kind of stuff, it's a different mentality. And it could, again, I go back to evolve us as a species. And so Quantum Leap has that breadth and width of storytelling to inform, entertain, educate, um, but mostly entertain. And then you take from it what you want. And we really respected the audience to lay out both sides of the story. And then you, st you figure out where you stand on it, but at least you listened to both sides of the story. Yeah. Do you think, though, in some of those conversations that as much as you want to leave room for other ideas and opinions, you know, that there are certain ideas that don't belong in the conversation? What do you mean? Well, I mean, we, we want we want to have a conversation. But if somebody is, you know, expressing bigoted ideas and, and hateful, you know, ideology, do we really want to leave room for that in, in the conversation? I mean, I think we want to leave room for the person, right? But do we leave room for those ideas? I mean, I'm genuinely asking, because I don't know the answer. I mean, I think the question to ask is, what are you so afraid of? Yeah. This is all fear-based, all of it. Something's being taken away from you. How is it being taken away from you if you've never achieved it? You're imagining that I could be rich, so I better get let these taxes go through. <laughs> yeah. Take away Medicare. Yeah, okay, well, that's really only Obamacare. It doesn't affect me. Uh, yeah, it does. Yeah. If you're living b below a certain line of income. Um, 
So I think it's re-educating or educating um, people to understand that social services are for society. They're not for the poor. They're for the middle class that's dwining and dwindling. Um, you know, I, I don't know how deep down that road uh, any show gets to go. Mm -hmm. Because studios and networks have to be, especially networks, have got to be very on an even line. So for us to even back all those years ago, push that boundary um, for the conversation, I thought was very impressive and very important. And I think that um, Martin and Dean and Shakina did it uh, certainly on Let Them Play. Yeah. They push that boundary. And, you know, some people push back and that's okay. As long as you don't, as long as you don't put hate on it, just say it's it's not something that I understand or can accept or um, fits with my ideology. Uh, that's okay. That's who you are. Now, you know, you know, you know who you are. I know who mm -hmm. you are. Mm -hmm. And um, come back next week. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, um, you know, uh, you mentioned Black and White on Fire, which I, I had the chance to tell you not too long ago is is one of my favorite episodes of the classic series, if not, you know, my favorite episode. I go back and forth. Um, and, and, you know, <laughs> you would, uh, thou shalt not actually. <laughs> <laughs> I okay. just, I love it. I don't, I, I, I think that to, to me, one of the things that thou shalt not does is it examines grief and mourning in a way that I genuinely feel I've not seen done on network television, at least not in a single hour ever. Well, like I, I, I firmly believe that. Um, but black on white on fire, I love so much. And, uh, we, when, when we recorded our episode, uh, about it, uh, we had the good fortune, my friend Lamont joined us and, um, and his wife is white. And, uh, it was, you know, it was interesting to have the conversation with him because you, you know, you would, you'd, you'd hope obviously that here we are like 50 years removed from when the episode is set. Um, but hearing him talk about some of his own struggles and some of even, you know, with, with her family, um, and, and and the effect that that has. And I think about a lot of what you said too, about history and the idea that for, unfortunately, a lot of public schools in this country aren't teaching certain things that need yeah. to be taught. And you mentioned Black Wall Street earlier, for instance, I was ashamed and mad at myself that I didn't know what that was until about four years ago. And I just thought, how is that possible? How did I not know about this? And it's the reason why I've always contended that, you know, history is history. And, and, and we can label this black history. We can label this LGBTQ history, but it's all ours. You know, we all have to own it and, and we have to own, you know, our place in it. Um, if we're going to learn from it, if we're going to be able to have those conversations yes. and, 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 and that education is so incredibly important. Black and white on fire, getting back to that, you told me that you had originally written it as a play. Um, and I'm curious, uh, the transition going from the play to being an episode of Quantum Leap, and and also about the hit, had the importance of getting the history right in the episode, and if there were any sacrifices, not necessarily about the history, but just in general that you had to make artistically or creatively getting from the play to the television show. Um, only that I didn't have the time to really remember the speech that CC Pounder gave where the bus was overturned and she comes home and she's shaken and she's upset. I mean, that yeah. monologue probably went on for two pages or a page and a half, maybe. Mm. Yeah, at least. And I had to trim that down. Yeah. Um, although I thought the, the monologue itself became better because it, it really explored it. The same kind of thing with, um, God, what's the character's name? the the older brother 
who wanted to, uh-oh, you guys are both frozen. Are you there? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> here we, we lost you for a second. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah, you you were frozen. Yeah. So we're okay. <laughs> We're fine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're totally fine. Sorry. You were um you were saying about uh, the monologue and having to uh, shorten it, um, but that uh, it was still successful, if not more so. Yes, and the same thing with uh, Lonnie, the older brother, yeah. and his anger and where that came from. And really, I wanted to ex to express in the script those those levels of anger that people feel when they have become marginalized by society where, you know, here's a guy that's probably as smart, you know, as smart as his brother, but he's picking up trash. Um, and he's never going to get the opportunity because the, the, the timing was different and he had to keep working to help pay for his brother's education. And the idea that he would move away from the neighborhood and take away what he was fighting to have, um, to give to community was heartbreaking to me because yeah. it does have, you know, and you look at what's happening in our world now with homelessness and, or unhousedness, um, it's frustrating. These, yeah. there, there are many, many, many people and families that have lost their homes and they're building uh, everywhere in Los Angeles, but the prices of these homes are, you can't afford them and, right. and pay your heating bill, your water bill, your food for your kids. You know, we, we've, again, we've got to change and what's going to happen when machines come in and the, the jobs are taken away. Mm -hmm. That's going to happen. So yeah. we really need to, revise the one of the things about the the revival series that's been kind of amazing to see have been the you know the thematic elements that they that have stretched a, across the series thus far and one of those certainly it happens to be the effect of technology um on our lives and you know specifically like this this amazing piece of technology right that sam beckett created that they're now using that you know that ben has reprogrammed in some way and you know all the good that it can do are there consequences what are those consequences and i i think that that's a piece of where we're headed potentially even for for the finale without without knowing anything at all um it, it, obviously it's something that you're concerned with just based off of, of, of what you've been saying do you think that that's something that you've in the original series, there are certainly elements that I think carried through, but they, they didn't necessarily have the same intention, I feel like, that this has. Do you think that that's something that you could have done 30 years ago? Or just because the way TV is made now compared to the way it was made then, it's not something that you could have really gotten as deeply into? It was, you know, it was pretty... Our first reviews said, they have changed all the rules of time travel. And... <laughs> <laughs> rules of time travel. Yeah. <laughs> and we didn't think we were going to go off the air at the, you know, at the end of that season. I, yeah. I, was, I have like six shows in, in the pipeline that we were writing and developing to keep shooting after hiatus. And when they just came wow. in and said, we're pulling the plug, I, everybody's mouth fell open. Wow. So we didn't get a chance. You know, yeah. we were enjoying all the things that are Quantum Leap and creating all the opportunities and, you know, going to Scott saying, you play baseball, you can sing. Okay. I think the, the <laughs> hardest one was when, um, well, well, the first time he was a woman and it was just, he said, I have new respect for women. I sat on that cold chair with <laughs> stockings and a skirt. <laughs> <laughs> And then when I did eight and a half months or nine and a half months, um, and he had to be in labor for three days. And so I bought him like a, a belly that you put in hot water packs. So you felt the heat, you put in 
pellets so that it pressed on your kidneys and made you go want to go to the bathroom. And it was it weighed like 30 pounds and it made him. It it made and he's such a good actor and he really uh, adapted and used it to his advantage. But um, how you get up from a chair, you know, those kind of things. So I I think we just didn't get the opportunity. I think we would have explored it. Um, the show was ahead of its time. I mean, my Vision Quest books, people keep saying they're way ahead of its time. Although in Vision Quest, the Great Quakes of 2029 keep scaring me because we keep having these earthquakes. They're pretty massive. Yeah. yeah. I say that we unify the planet. Mm. That's uh, yeah. To jump back, you talk about like, you know, your, your jaws dropped when they came in and let you know that you were um, canceled at the at, at the end of season five. There's been a lot of renewed interest in the final episode in the last few years because there was the the lost footage found uh, shooting old Al and old Beth in the future. And I know Sam's like really curious about like that is like like the story behind that being like shot. How much of it got shot? Because I I think we heard somewhere like they may have, they they may have been in the middle of shooting that particular scene when when it was found out they were all canceled so can you kind no, of no, give us a story of like when... when we shot that whole episode oh okay no okay they came to us and said this is gonna be the last episode um and i think we were two wow. episodes out or one episode out and don had to write that he says i really want to write that and um when he wrote it and he gave it to me i said and he brought sam home And I said, you Mm. can't. And he went, what do you mean? I said, you cannot bring him home. You have to leave him out there or the show will Mm -hmm. never come back. And he, we, we had a fight about it. And he said, I don't understand what you're saying. I said, well, let me put it this way. Did you ever watch the fugitive? And he wrote, he said, well, yeah. I said, well, he caught the one armed man. That was the end of the show. Sam comes home. It's the end of the show. And he went, got it. And so <laughs> and I said, and besides that, leave him out there to give hope to people. And just like that, that man said to me, I kept hoping Sam would leap into my life. And it, yeah. so it, I was right on that. And I'm glad that he did it. Um, and, and let Sam make the choice of wanting to keep doing good. <laughs> Do you, um, this is, this is one of those, you know, silly lore type of questions we've speculated as to, as far as Sam continuing to leap around in time, do you, in, in, in your head, was he doing that as himself as he did in the last episode or was he still leaping into other people or was it maybe a mix of both? Well, I could tell you, but I have to. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, here's a question, too, going back uh, real quick to Black and White on Fire um, and, and Color of Truth, for that matter, and What Price Gloria and, and, and others. But, um, you know, one of the things that's, I think, so poignant about Black and White on Fire is that in the end, Sam doesn't really necessarily save the day, right? Like Lonnie dies in his arms, and it's a, it's a heartbreaking moment. Um, in what price Gloria and color of truth, like he, he still saves the day in, in those episodes. How do you sort of contend with him? And, and, and we've always tried to contextualize the episodes based off of when they were set, when they were written slash aired, and then where we are now today. So thinking about that, what do you say about the idea that maybe Sam was kind of playing into that white savior trope? That that here he is, you know, coming in to save the day, you know, make this black man's life better, uh, make this woman's life better. Um, because I'm I'm very curious as to what you think about that, uh, especially knowing that you you wrote those episodes. Um, and and in my mind, it's not something that probably would have really been thought much about in 1989, but obviously it's something we think a lot about in 2023. As a black woman, I absolutely thought about it. Um. But the reality was that's how I could get my stories told. And Mm. the stories were as important. And that's why Sam didn't always save the day. And if you look at what price Gloria 
I specifically wrote that ending was after he saved um, the young girl from jumping off the ledge, he went back in and taught a lesson to this, you know, chauvinistic jerk and said, I'm a man. And to write that, I went to the male writers and I sat them down and I said, tell me an experience of what it is to be a man that a woman would never know about, <laughs> never mm. understand about. And um, I used them. I absolutely use them, you know, the, the idea of having a, a permanent erection where you have to carry your books in front of you mm -hmm. so that nobody knew. <laughs> Certainly mm -hmm. not in my experience, but, and, and Scott did it so accessibly and brilliantly. And, and when he threw the baseball, took the donut and threw the baseball and I, I thought, here's an opportunity to show the difference of men and women. Um, so it was much, it was, it's, again, you get these opportunities in this show. Yeah. You just do to, to mm. explore the other side, the other sides. And I wanted, I think more in this show than, um, and again, we were on for five years, so we had the time to do it. The opportunity for Sam to really walk into, uh, the shoes of someone who was being affected by the problem. Um, I mean, when he leapt into the black fighter, uh, he wasn't the one with the problem. It really was the brother. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it's tangential when you go in that direction. And he plays a lot of women the second half of this first season. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> poor Ray walking in heels <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they've been very kind to him. As far as I'm concerned, they've given him kind shoes. I think in, <laughs> until he gets to come fly with me. Um, and then I said, he's got to be in stilettos. He's a 1970s <laughs> um, airline stewardess. And you, it, you know, it's hard to walk in those shoes. You got to walk on your mm -hmm. tiptoes yeah. and, and look like you're gliding on air. So, you know, again, you guys have, you get new respect when you have to, to walk in those oh, yeah. shoes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, it, it, it's funny because Dennis and I both have a background in theater and uh, I don't know about Dennis actually, but I've, I've played a woman a couple of times and have worn heels and dresses and stockings and, and everything <laughs> else. And mm -hmm. it definitely, it lets you know, it lets you know. Um, I, I, you know, one of the things too, that I'm curious about what price Gloria, Dennis and I talked about this a couple of times and, you know, more out of a sense of humor, but also out of an idea of like, oh yeah, maybe it was. Um, what do you think happened when Sam leapt out and Samantha Stormer is left there with this, this man who has been, you know, a threat to her and now, you know, she's in the room with him and, you know, how much does she realize about what's just happened that she's kind of showed, you know, given him this lesson? Um, you know, do you think that she was in any danger? Do you think that that guy is just completely like shut down now and is never going to bother her again? I'm curious about that. Um, I, I can't remember if we had a follow up where Al said she's now running the company or she's an executive or something like that. I want to say that. I believe she so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. She profited from it. Um, and became successful uh, based on the ideas that Sam put forward. You know, don't build a bigger gas tank, build a smaller car because he's in the present looking at what's happening to gas prices. Right. Back then, you know, not what they are today, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, there was a wrap up, as I remember. Yes. A little no, bit you. You're absolutely right. There, there, there was. We, like I said, we, we those are the types of things that we get to muse about on the podcast sometimes. Like, what happened <laughs> after he left? Like, I wonder what happened when you know so and so let back in and they were in this situation. Um, which I, I guess. So it, obviously, we want to be respectful of your time. There's Don't wait too much longer. There's a great episode um, in the trilogy. There's a a whole line in the second part of the trilogy where Sam leaps back in 
oh no, the third part of the trilogy. Mm -hmm. And the, he says that, or she says, um, Laura, uh, what's her name? Laura Harding says, yeah. oh yeah, we never got married. He ran off to Hollywood to write a book about some alien or, you know, so I covered mm -hmm. it in the sense that this is the whole white waiting room. That was how I dealt with the waiting room that sure. he mm -hmm. had shared memories of something and he sees you know, that waiting room, which was very futuristic. And he thinks he's been abducted by aliens and goes to Hollywood to write a book. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are tidbits of what we could do. Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, and that's the, I mean, honestly, that stuff has been very, you know, fertile ground for us because it's, it's the type of stuff that we like to think of, uh, you know, all the time and, 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 and chat about on here. But I am curious, like, for, since, since we have you here, a little more specificity, you know, dreams. One of the things that I, I think a lot of fans love about dreams is the idea that the person that Sam has leapt into having their memories and, 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 you know, kind of seeing things through their point of view. And, and of course, with Lee Harvey Oswald, you know, the, idea that Sam is taking on some of those personality traits, taking on his persona during that leap. Um, I'm curious as to how much you think the, you know, the, the Lee B remembers about what happened while Sam was there when they get back, or if they don't remember any of it, and also how much Sam you know, kind of carries with him after he leaps out. Um, because obviously we, you know, we, we saw instances of him not really remembering previous leaps or, you know, with the Swiss cheese effect and everything. So I'm just kind of curious as to, uh, you know, how much of that was something that you wanted to maybe explore more or where you think that that kind of lands for, um, for the leaps and, 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 and the people that he's leapt into. Well, we really couldn't explore it more. But I thought they did a really good job in the Bounty Hunter episode where Magic tells a story about being left into. Yes. Yeah. I thought uh, Ernie Hudson did a brilliant job of, but he said very clearly, I missed two days, but I knew yeah. something had happened and I didn't know what it was. And when I started to pick up the pieces and put them together, I found this project because so obviously there's some um, memory that you have of whether just you're missing for two days, but, and, and we did it again in, um, in Shakina's episode yeah, where uh -huh. the constant drawing of Ian's face. Um, so there's something there. So somewhere, somehow um, in, in their memory of that, that cross leap, when Ian leapt into that character, somebody got to look in the mirror to see yeah. who they were, and it wasn't their face. Um, you know, so we touched on it, but right. again, it's not—it's not the core, it's not the heart, it's not the soul the, of the show. Sure, but sure, people ask those questions, and also we respect the audience enough to want to be creative and imagine. What would yes. happen to me? What the, yes. And to me, that get that makes it um, interactive. Yes. Absolutely. But, I mean, honestly, that's one of the things that sometimes, again, taking part in that conversation in a very different manner than some of the stuff we we're talking about earlier. But one of the things I love about the conversation around the show, both the classic series and the revival series, is that, yeah, there are, there are things that are left as question marks. And I think that that's OK, because it does give us the opportunity to use our imaginations, to engage with the show, as opposed to just sit back and let it happen to us. Um, and I think that that's key for, for art is that, you, you know, you have to engage with it. Um, I'm curious, one of the things that I sometimes say, uh, uh and, and there are a few episodes, none of, none of yours, um, <laughs> that, that I'm aware of, I don't know which ones that you necessarily did rewrites on or whatever, but there are a couple of episodes of the classic series where I feel like the leap kind of happens to Sam as opposed to the, you know, Sam happening to the leap. Um, and, and I'm curious kind of like, you know, what you would make of that, uh, as far as him being more passive, um, because I feel like one of the hallmarks of any great episode of the show is that he has to be, you know, an active participant in the events and that there are a couple of episodes where he does feel a little bit more passive and it just kind of feels like everything's happening to him. And, and I'm not as engaged with those. Um, one of the things that I told Shakina about let them play is I felt like it really did a wonderful job of treading a line where it could have been that, that the episode happened to Ben as opposed to Ben happening to it. And I thought that she really threaded that needle so perfectly. Um, 
I don't necessarily know exactly what my question is here, to be completely honest, but basically, <laughs> you know, what is your opinion on that? What do you think about that as far as, you know, the difference between the leap happening to, you know, to Ben or Sam as opposed to them happening to the leap? I personally like it when the leap happens to Sam. But, you know, when we did Jimmy and we had mm -hmm. him leap into, a, a, there's a new term for challenged. Um, uh, intellectually disabled. I think that's the. Is that the, the new the, term? The term now, yeah. Um, again, we, we walked a fine line, but he had to navigate that. I think um, in Shakina's case, it was important to have a trans person in that show. And um, the story could be told e e either way. Ben could have leapt into this trans character and, and experienced everything that was happening. I think it's more powerful that way. But I also really appreciated the fact that they found this wonderful young um, trans actor and um, gave them the opportunity to tell that story. So there's a time when... You know, you just, you make that choice of what's more powerful and what's more important. Um, mm. But I, you know, I have said when I talk to the writers, anytime that, that Ben is, leaps into the person that the story is about, um, it's just going to be more powerful for me. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Invested in a different way uh, absolutely i mean i think that that's i think that's absolutely true it's interesting because you know i think shock theater is kind of a good example of you know sam not necessarily having a lot of agency you know just due to the nature of of that leap and yet it's a, it's an incredibly powerful episode um and i think a lot of that comes from the fact that the the relationship between sam and al is just so key to to the heart and core of the classic series in a lot of ways um and seeing what Al struggles with, you know, trying to connect with Sam and, and not being able to, um, was there ever any thought given? And it was obviously it was played with a couple of times, like with honeymoon express and then with a leap for Lisa, um, of stretching that relationship out even more of, of, of putting more obstacles between, you know, Sam and Al being able to connect, or was it just because that was kind of necessary for the show to kind of run, you know, the vehicle to kind of operate they were the, the, the main components um, that you couldn't do that. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. I'd have to think about that in the <laughs> sense that, I mean, one of the one of the things that we had freedom with was the fact that um, Sam could fall in love, mm. and this show he's in love, right? So that that shifted a whole direction mm. of um, what the network wanted. They wanted a love story, and I think that's why the show was designed the way it was designed. One of the things that we wanted was to have that open door to show the loneliness of being out there and to show what it felt like to have someone who belonged to you already thinking it was you uh, or thinking you were somebody else. Um, and then what feelings came back because you had their feelings. It's like somebody, you know, you hear these stories of people getting a heart transplant and suddenly mm. they mm. they love a football team that they've never heard of or they love a food that they've never mm. <laughs> had before and then you find out that the person who donated that heart those were their tribute so to sure. me quantum leap is no different from somebody leaping into your body as an organ or somebody leaping into your body as a time traveler mm. yeah that's amazing i love that i love that um, just a couple more questions real quick, uh, and then we'll, then we'll let you get out of here. Um, but uh, I, I'm curious, you know, there's a lot of speculation for, uh, from fans um, and, and imagination, and I, I'm sure that this is one of those things that you won't necessarily want to put a definitive answer on, but um, that the Evil Leaper Project um, <laughs> was, uh, was something that originated either based off of the hand link that got left behind in the Leap Back um, in the 40s, or that uh, it may have come from when Sam was um, 
interrogated um by by the air force um and you know gave all the details of the project in in um the episode starlight star bright yeah or it could be a combo of both or I'm to interject i'm gonna i'm gonna really geek yeah, out go, about for it, go for it it's not it's not just the interrogation in starlight star bright in the episode before when he's leaped into the serial killer who's ho- boarded mm. himself in a home he tells the mother and the little girl who he really is the little girl goes out and tells the sheriff so you have two episodes in a row where sam's identity is revealed in a way and then the very next episode you have the evil leaper project introduced we're nerds <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you have to remember how far out we have to start developing these shows. Sure. Mm-hmm. The fact that it's back to back, I don't know that one had. Uh... I don't think there was any real intention. It's just what the fans have done with. Oh, with really? The okay. Uh, you know, I, yeah. I, I'd have to think about that. I'm not <laughs> sure. Yeah. It was influenced to... that. I mean, those certainly are. This is what I love about the fans because they see things that just make the show better. And they go, oh, yeah, that connects to that, and that connects to that. And <laughs> want people to do that because, again, they're invested mm-hmm. in it. So to to kind of, like, follow up on that, like, in the same vein, uh, you may be bored to tears with this question, but I don't think our listeners would be happy with us if we didn't ask. I'm not going to ask you whether or not we're ever going to hear Ziggy in the new series because then you would have to kill me. Um, <laughs> but in the classic series, like, for the first three seasons, Ziggy was talked about as a he – And then in the leap back, there you are. And it's like, you are so tied to the role of Ziggy. Like one, do you remember like what the process was in deciding that you were going to be Ziggy? And two, did you think like that would become such a huge part of the show's lore? Well, of course I did. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, we were trying to make Ziggy androgynous. But Mm -hmm. there's a, so in that androgyny, there's a feminine side, there's a masculine side. And I Mm -hmm. think in my mind, Ziggy was in love with Sam. Sam Mm -hmm. was her creator um, or his creator, whichever side do you want to tell that story (laughs) from? Mm -hmm. Um, But I, I always wanted Ziggy to be an important part of, time, space, God, Mm -hmm. whatever, in the sense that I think she, and I call her she, is sentient and and saw the injustices of humanity and said, oh, I understand this, and there's something that should be done with it that could make the world a better place, could make people better people. And that's, that she is benevolent in the sense that the difference that she makes by maybe choosing the the leaps that Sam leaps into, that maybe it's not as random as we think it is. Mm. Okay. That it's very specific. um, And that there's an end goal Mm. is Mm. what I like to believe. And, you know, again, if I come back to, to this show as a, uh, character or or the film as a character or whatever, then um, that's something that I would definitely explore as a creator uh-huh. to say that it's a collective consciousness that we have built into these machines. And, I love that. And that, again, I go back to how we can work together with technology to to take care of ourselves as human beings. And so I don't know that I have a full answer on that, but I want to believe mm-hmm. that, you know, Ziggy is deus machina. I mean, I think mm-hmm. that that's a, I think that's a lovely answer. And I, and I, I mean, I, I am certainly among those that, that hope we get to hear Ziggy again. Um, but I definitely want it to, serve a purpose to serve the story i don't want it to just be one of those things that's you know like it's like oh the fans want it so we'll do it um that's the I, best reason of all <laughs> the time is right yeah what i let I, you you may love i don't because i think 
one of the things that I've heard recently, and I've, I've heard it from more than one place, that the fan lore is now is that Ziggy took a bow of silence after Sam got lost. And so that's why we're not. <laughs> That's why I we're not here. That. That's why we're not hearing her in the show now. And that's my favorite <laughs> explanation thus far. <laughs> of the people on the show, um, because Ian is so protective of Ziggy, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. maybe Addison, um, if anybody, if if there was anybody that Ziggy would speak to on this show, it would be Ian and Addison. Maybe yes, but definitely Ian, because yeah. Ian has that love and protection of the mm-hmm. character. And, you know, let's see what happens in the next couple of episodes. <laughs> um, you know, one of the th- theories that I know that some people had, including myself for a while, is that Janice was going to be the one to get Ziggy to talk again, that she would come in, you know, and, and because she'd had the hand link and because of her relationship with her father, that she would kind of know the, the way to, to get Ziggy going again. Um, what do you think about the character of Janice now that, you I know, love the, Janice. The... <laughs> I love Janice. I love Janice. I and truthfully, I had this whole made up storyline. I, I talked to Georgina. Um, she was doing some, uh, some scene with him. And she said the line, oh, has it aired yet? Wait a minute. I may not be able to say this. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. We, do, we so don't want to get anyone in so trouble, close. especially you. So close. <laughs> I, uh, what I said to her was, are you in love with him? Mm. Mm. He came to her and asked for her help to save Addison. So, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Yeah. And she went, I don't know. It's not in the script. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I love those types of questions, though. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, kind of the a big question that I know a lot of folks have, and, and we were even encouraged to ask this to you by some of our, our listeners, because we, we didn't tell many people that we were going to get the chance to talk to you. Mostly, I think, out of that idea of like, if, if I say it, and then it, then it won't actually happen, and you know, something will go wrong. And, you know, um, but, uh, but we did tell a couple of people. And one of the questions that got thrown our way was um, uh, basically about Janice and, you know, her sisters is that with the sort of lost ending that was rediscovered, um, it was, you know, kind of made firm that Al and Beth, of course, got back together and that they had four daughters. And this was something that had been known for a while, even before the scene was discovered, because there had been talk about it all the way back, you know, like the mid 90s. You know, I can remember reading about it in like 1998 or 1999 on like AOL or something like that. Um, do you view that lost ending as a part of the story, do you view that as kind of like that conversation took place that Al talked to Beth about this, that Sam was indeed in the future and that Al was going to have to go to try and find him? Or do you just view that as sort of apocrypha that it's sort of like, you know, well, yeah, we filmed it, but it didn't air. And so it doesn't really necessarily count. You'd have to talk to Don about that. I mean, he based the four <laughs> sisters on my four sisters. I have four sisters, Diane, Donna, oh, wow. Donna and um <clears throat> and he wanted this chauvinist to be given <laughs> a slice of justice by having four daughters to protect them from people like wow. him mm-hmm. um but i also think he wanted to show that when with that amazing scene where he dances with beth to yeah. Georgia and begs her to don't give up on him. I think that was such a moving moment that it needed fruition. It needed an ending to say good things came. And that when we leap in the leap back. So if you look at both those shows Don wrote, um, the, the fact that, that Scott came and talked to Beth and said, wait for him. We didn't need to see it, but at the same time, you wanted to know what happened. Mm -hmm. And that's why it wasn't in the show. You didn't need to see it. You didn't need to know what happened. And then when I wrote Starcrossed and he was able to put her with her father so she didn't leave him at the altar again, that was a salute back to that show 
where you saw that she was there. She was waiting for him. She was part of the team to, to bring him home. Um, and what happened from there, <laughs> another conversation where I'd have to kill you. Um, <laughs> you know, if she's in the future, did, will she meet Sammy Joe? Did she meet Sammy Joe? And yeah. how does she feel about a time child? And I mean, there's so many threads. Uh, oh, yeah. I, and it's the type of stuff, that, again, that, that we've, you know, certainly made a meal out of on the show more than once. <laughs> um, all right. Here's a question for you real quick that you might not be able to answer or might not want to answer. Given the opportunity, would you would you cast Melora Hardin as Sammy Joe, the 2023 version of Sammy Joe? I love Melora. That's funny. <laughs> I don't know. It was a good question, but I love Melora yeah. Harding for sure. Um, you know, it depends on the budget of the movie. That's where it depends on. <laughs> sure, sure. Because <laughs> I did. <laughs> um, dollar movie. Yeah, but yeah. Hardy, I mean, I think she was so good in those episodes in two yeah. and three. And she's a pleasure to work with. She did a short film for me after that. And um, she's just a very talented actress. So anything's possible. <laughs> um, you mentioned the four H's, you know, hope, humor, history, and heart. Without necessarily being too specific, because I don't necessarily want you to have to, you know, give anything away. But is there a story that you want to tell a specific story that you want to tell that encapsulates those four and what period of history would it be set in? Um, there is a story that I, I had pitched to, where was it? I pitched it both the studio and to uh, sci-fi and they kind of liberated it, which kind of broke my heart. It took mm. it and gave it to another writer. I understand that never mm -hmm. it never got done, but um, it was it was um, nine eleven mm. because it affected mm -hmm. all of us. It changed our world, mm. <clears throat> and um, so I had written that in the story that I wanted to tell, sure. and they didn't realize it until it was you know, at so close to that moment. And of course, when they tried to, to get the word out, nobody believed them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and the truth of that, the day changed, but those are the kind of moments in history that deserve to be quantum leap. Sure. Yeah. They Absolutely. do. And we, we can't forget them. Um, and they happened for a reason that do we change them or not? There's some universe out there that it didn't happen. And if we're into the omniverse, metaverse, parallel worlds, whatever, mm -hmm. I kind of <laughs> believe in those too. Oh yeah. But things happen the way they're supposed to happen. And, sure. and quantum leap gets to tell the story. And I'm just grateful mm. that this show has, found a new audience, that it's kept its old audience, that um, it's in the middle, stayed alive with a, a generations of audiences. And I really yeah. hope that NBC and Universal see the franchise capabilities of all the things that, that Quantum mm -hmm. Leap can be. Um, but most of all, that they understand that it is a show about hope. You know, what I'm I'm waiting for, I haven't seen it yet, is A Kiss with History on the new show. <laughs> <laughs> they were hard as hell to do, but when you did them, they were just wonderful. Yeah. Um, and anything I write is going to have one or two. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think the fans like that connection to history, to see, you know, 
Sam teaching, teaching Michael Jackson the moonwalk. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's one of the things that's fascinating sometimes, too, is that growing up when I was watching the show, all of this stuff was, bef- you know, most of it anyway was before I was born, you know, because I, I was eight, seven. I was seven when the show started to air. But I have a very vivid, distinct memory of watching Genesis the night that it, you know, the night that it aired originally. And, um, now, of course, you know, there are episodes that are airing that not only took place in my lifetime, but took place, you know, 10, 20 years ago. And it's like, ah, yes, you know, I remember that. And I think that the the, the power of the show, both, you know, the classic and the revival is that we're given the opportunity to not only stand in someone else's shoes, but to see events from a different perspective. And I know for a fact the impact that it's had on my life and going back to the original series and, and learning so much, not only about history, but about what it means to, to be good, to be, to be human, to be kind. Um, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. I again, invite anyone the night that, um, Adrian and my episode airs on February 20th at Mm -hmm. 10 p.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. Western or Pacific and 9 p.m. Central um, Mm -hmm. to to please write, write to NBC and tell us your story as an immigrant and how family is important to you. Um, Because let me tell you something, every one letter or email is worth a thousand. Mm -hmm. It's counted as a thousand. And Mm -hmm. that, is incredibly empowering to have that love from a show uh, come to the network and say it. But, you know, even on Twitter, come on Twitter mm-hmm. with us that night and I'll try my v- best. To tweet. <laughs> I'm just, Sam, Sam usually does most of our tweets on episode nights. You two should get together off mic and Sam can give you a tutorial, the art <laughs> of watching the show and live tweeting at the same time. Okay. <laughs> first yeah, things was... first, forgive yourself for any typos. Because <laughs> they're bound to happen. <laughs> mm-hmm. no, thank you, um, gentlemen. This has yeah. been a real pleasure. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much, Deborah. This has been an honor. I cannot thank you enough for sharing your your wisdom, your passion, your heart with us. Um, it's been it's been moving. It's been fun. It's been funny. Um, I've learned a lot. Uh, I can't imagine that it would have been any other way having you sit virtually across from me. Um, so thank you so much for that. And uh, I will speak on behalf of our listeners uh, as well. I'm sure that they are grateful to have had this opportunity to hear from you. Um, and uh, hopefully we get the chance to do it again sometime. I hope so too, for the movie. Let's do the movie. Yeah. All right. right. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> Don't leave the series, but come back for the movie. <laughs> That's right. All right. Thank Take you care, so Deborah. Much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Keep the lead. Cool. Yeah, that was a blast. And like you had kind of mentioned beforehand, uh, the fact that our conversation, I think, went on so many wonderful tangents, um, uh, which is, you know, the show, right, that we do. Um just the the social commentary, the cultural commentary, the you know the depth oh. of conversation, the passion that she brought to bear on so many different topics that obviously were connected to what we were talking about with the show, but um, much like our conversation with Shakina, in some ways, you know, would stand on their own, separate from the show. Um, and I really appreciated that. I thought it was just such a wonderful opportunity to get some insight, um, you know, into this wonderful human and where she stands on, uh, uh, on, on a lot of these topics um, that, again, you know, are certainly interwoven into the show, but, but stand on their own separate and apart from the show as well. Um, and and I, I just really appreciated her candor um, and and how forthright she was about things. You know, I I, I didn't feel like there was much in the way of veneer. Uh, um, not not that I felt that way, honestly, with anyone that we've spoken with. I feel like we've been uh-huh. you know very very lucky in, in in that you know everyone that we've spoken with, whether it's Dean or. or, or you know, Drew, Benjamin, Derek, uh, Shakina, I, I just feel like everyone has uh-huh. been, you know, very down to earth and very direct and, and very forthright and, you know, and, and not too, uh, uh, cagey unless of course we ask a question that they can't answer. Um, and then we get to this poker to face, yes. uh, our Deborah Pratt. Yeah. <laughs> I could say, yeah, yeah, exactly. I could tell yeah. you, but I'll have to kill you. Um, and so, 
Yeah, I, I just 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 what a what a again, what a wonderful experience. And and I couldn't help but feel like multiple times and especially at the very beginning of the interview, I was I was just a kid. I was just a kid, you know. I was uh-huh. a kid who was sitting in front of my TV, you know, watching USA Network reruns in you know, when I was in junior high, right? Like that's uh-huh. that's where I that's what I felt like most, you know. Not like the little like 8-year-old who watched Quantum Leap when it originally aired, but like, you know, the 14-year-old who's, you know, was sitting in his bedroom watching his VHS tapes that he had programmed his VCR to record Quantum Leap, you know, uh, when he uh-huh. was in school on USA Network and everything. Like like it just took me it took me back so much and it, it you know hopefully i didn't sound like too much of an idiot <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, I mean, or so too fawning I, but yeah, yeah. I, I said this at one point like i i didn't realize it was possible to be so nervous that you just loop back around to being chill right I i'm fine <laughs> and as far yeah. as this, I'll, I'll say this now because I, I hadn't thought about it before but at one point during the interview i really thought about throwing you under the bus and bringing up portrait for Troyan. <laughs> oh man <laughs> That haunts like, me. That, I was like, no, it, it, it haunts no, me. No, I won't. I won't do that. <sighs> yeah, no. Uh, yeah. It, 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 yeah. It, 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 well, you know, truth of the matter is, I should use this as an excuse, but I was drinking a lot back then. So. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, that's, no. That's, I, that's right. That's a piss poor excuse. Um, no, I, I look, it, it, she's just she was so, so lovely and so giving and generous with her time and um, with the details, you know, recalling uh-huh. some of these details, things that happened on set with like Dean and, and, you know, look, I mean, there are definitely some stories that I, I'm sure people have heard before, um, you, you know, that, that she uh, shared with us uh, in our, in our interview, but um, uh-huh. to be able to hear them, you know, as the person sitting across the, the virtual table, so to speak, uh, it was just so lovely. And, uh-huh. and, um, I, I really hope we get the chance to do it again because there's so much stuff, so uh-huh. much stuff we left on the table. Um, yeah. You know, and there's a lot of stuff that I would love to kind of, you know, even follow up on and other conversations I'd love to have based off of some of the things that she said. Sure. My quest is still on to find someone who will actually talk about the lost footage. Because <laughs> Deborah very politely sidestepped I, that question, I'm like, ah, I'm not going to push it. All right. <laughs> yeah, see, see, like I, it, there were a couple of times when I just kind of felt like, is she just telling us to go talk to Don? Like, is that what I'm getting here? Is I'm getting like, you know, you're going to have to ask Don about that one. Like, I mean, I feel, yeah. which is fine. I'd love to. Like, I, I mean, you know, but sure. But, uh, no, I, 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 I think that um, it is interesting. Some of that, some of that stuff. Um, that seems to be like there's conflicting versions of certain things, right? Like, because you sure. asked the question about when they heard about cancellation, right? And and and, oh, yeah. and you know, and and she was like, you know, no, we knew we knew while we were filming. Um, she was like, when they wrote it, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. And so it was kind of like it was kind of like, oh wow, okay. I mean, you know, because I I feel like there are some there are certain things where you you, you do almost wonder like, okay, I know that she's not lying to us obviously but is there more to this maybe than than you know just like her perspective well, on with it, the, which, story, yeah. the answer is yes right like i mean it, you know there's there's obviously multiple perspectives on a lot of these events um but that was the great mm. thing is it's like we just you know we just got deborah right like we got sure we got to hear from from her and and, and even hearing about the genesis of the show right mm. and and the idea that it had been something that she had had in mind for so long and had mm. like you know, didn't necessarily even wasn't sure she could share. Right. And then mm-hmm. having the opportunity to just kind of, you know, to, to, to one day, like say to Don and be like, okay, here it is, you know, and then, and then there being that opportunity to be like, all right, we're going to, you know, we're going to pitch this. Let's see what happens. And, you know, it was just, it's, I don't know. So, so wonderful. And then, and hearing about like, you know, it, it's funny because in the realm of television and in the realm of like television production, production and network TV, like a name like Brandon Tartikoff seems almost mythical, you know, mm-hmm. I don't want to be hyperbolic, but it's true. And so to hear mm-hmm. these stories about like his advocacy for the show, how he got the show, you know, and how like, um, he wanted to ensure that it, that, that, that it had, you know, some sort of fidelity to kind of like their, their vision. Um, it's encouraging, you know, it, cause it, I think we often are painted pictures of, of these executives as being, you know, maybe kind of dim or, you know, only concerned with the bottom line mm. or, 
you know, they just want they, they just want to produce this type of thing and they're not interested in anything else that might ask questions or challenge them or whatever. Um, and I think that that's I mean, let's face it, that's I'm sure that's unfair. I mean, sure, there are probably mm. people out there that are like that, but these are passionate, creative people and, you know, in positions of, 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 of power that puts them in charge of like billion dollars, you know, uh, uh, bottom lines that they have to, you know, take care of and shepherd. And, and, and there's only so much that you can probably do, but, you know, to hear stories about somebody like that, who, you know, care deeply about, you know, the content, um, that was you know being put out there and wanted it to measure up to a certain level of quality, um, yeah. and, and wasn't afraid to let it perhaps challenge the viewers in some ways, wasn't afraid to let it challenge even the advertisers, right. Which is, sure. which is really the thing that you got to be careful yeah. with. Um, I think is, you know, it is remarkable. And, and so I'm glad that she was able to share some of those stories and I thought it was really, yeah, it was such, um, it, it, it ended up being something that when it was over, I was kind of numb. I didn't even know how to articulate the experience and how I felt about getting mm. the opportunity. Sure. I just knew that it had happened and I knew that it was good. Sure. Not, not necessarily that I did like a good job. That's not what I'm talking about. Like it was just but a sure. good experience in my life, you know? Yeah. But that was it. Right. <laughs> uh, the, the post-show blues. Mm -hmm. You call it that. Mm -hmm. So, that's yeah, definitely I'm sure, what it yeah. was. Yeah. I mean, like, it's an actor thing, but in probably any field, any arena that you're in, you have some variation on the post show blues. But it's like it's when you have the event, when you have the thing, you have just like you are so geared up to do it, and then once it's over with, you are just left with this void. Yeah, like like it's gone. And the thing like with with theater, it's like it's it's so esoteric. Like you do a film, like like you have a final product, like you have a thing you can always go back and you know, we watch and do in theater. You don't really have that, do that thing. Now, right. Like this, like we have the thing we can go back and relive. So maybe that's not the best analogy, but I, I get what you're saying. It's that like, yeah, now you did this. Yeah. Thing, so looking forward to it. Now you're like, ah, well, what now? Right, right, right. Yeah. It's like, where do we go from here? It's all yeah. downhill now. No, it's all. <laughs> <laughs> we got, interview, we got mountains left to climb. <laughs> our, our interview with Deborah Pratt. It's all downhill now. No, it's uh, no. We won't do yeah. <laughs> we should probably wrap up um, and uh, get out of You brought up uh, yeah. Shakina and I want to brought this up. I don't know if you've been on Instagram today. Yeah. She so, so glad. has yep. been uh, invited to join the Directors Guild of America and Thrilled about that, but it also comes with a hefty price tag. So she has uh, started a, a GoFundMe, a Kickstarter. Uh, I think it's officially a GoFundMe, but it's she a GoFundMe. Term, yeah, yeah, it's a GoFundMe, but she used the term a Kickstart her in the in the caption. Mm -hmm. um, and we shared yeah. that in our Instagram stories. So go check. By the time this goes out, you won't see our Instagram stories anymore. Because right, 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 right. anyway, go check that out if you're. Able but it is. To go, it's on our Twitter go, feed. It's on our Twitter. It's on Twitter. I also, okay, so, I also retweeted it. Yeah. Oh, fantastic! Awesome. Yeah. So go, uh, go yeah. check that out if you're able to. We'll be next week. Uh, back next week with family style, which I'm really looking forward to. And Me too. Yeah. Any other housekeeping stuff that you want to? Um, okay. no, you know, just to, just, I, I want to reiterate that I think that, uh, the opportunity to have somebody like Shakina as a part of the DGA is, is quite frankly, it's incredibly important. And, mm -hmm. uh, I think that, um, you know, getting the opportunity to, uh, assist in ensuring that representation, um, can be seen for, for lack of a better word, uh, um, you know, in the material that, uh, that she, I'm sure will, will create and, 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 and obviously shepherd through, uh, works that will uh, be important, have an impact, uh, if, you know, for no other reason that there are people out there that'll be able to look at it and say like, Hey, you know, she, she's directing, maybe I can too, or, you know, she's helping to tell mm -hmm. my yep. story. And, and that means something, um, because uh, I, 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 you know, it, it, it's, it probably starts to sound gratuitous and some people I hope uh, are, are not anywhere near being numb to it. But the truth of the matter is I just can't help but go back to the fact that, you know, their kids, kids are dying and, 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 and anything we can do, um, to make sure that, uh, that, that they feel seen and valued, um, and that, that, you know, 
we want nothing more than for that light to, to grow and flourish and, and never want to turn that off uh, is important. And so while it might just seem like, you know, oh, here's here's somebody uh, who's asking us for money so that they can go, you know, make movies or TV shows or whatever. It's like, OK, sure, you could look at it like that. But this is also somebody that, you know, can can make stuff that that might help save a life. And um, oh, and so. Yeah. I, I gave I gave what little I could, um, sure. and, and hopefully <laughs> yeah. other people will will be yeah. able to do the same. Um, I know she's had a lot of support, and and I think that's awesome. Uh, on, on the other, on another note, actually, uh, kind of connected to that, uh, Trace Lysette, um, who uh, uh, played um, Counselor Kate in. Um, um, Oh my goodness! I just lost my mind, and I cannot think of the let them play. Whew. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, it, it, you know, she actually has a, a film um, that uh, premiered, I believe, sometime last year. Um, uh, did the festival circuit, and now is uh, hopefully going to go into wider release. And they're raising funds for um, the. Um, publicity for it in order to ensure that you know it gets it gets seen far and wide um and uh i, I think that uh, again another you know wonderful opportunity uh to to support uh, a trans artist and, and raise that level of representation the name of the film is monica um and mm-hmm. uh you know we'll include a little blurb about uh um you know that that campaign as well um and trace is awesome uh just a, a wonderful talented human being and um you know again someone who shared those talents uh, on that episode of Quantum Leap, you know, she was one of my favorite parts of the episode and an episode that mm-hmm. had many of my favorite, you know, favorite things in it. So, um, so yeah, I, you know, support where you can, right. You know, when we talk about like, you, you know, supporting all these worthy causes and stuff, sometimes it's about supporting other people and uplifting other artists and other voices in order to make sure that they are heard and seen, uh, because it has a ripple effect and it's incredibly important and hopefully we can do that. And, and that's something that is, you know, leapers and fellow travelers, we can help to, to put right what sometimes mm. unfortunately goes wrong. So, um so yeah uh, i would say that and i would also say that uh, i just want to say one more time thank you so much uh, deborah pratt for coming on the show and chatting with us um it was it was lovely um i just i just think that you know we got to share some time and space with uh, a human being who is full of grace and compassion and and wit and 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 passionate about what she does and it was really really an incredible experience not one that i will soon forget and as you said hey you know we can we can listen to it anytime we want right uh, sure. <laughs> so uh so so thank you deborah um and uh thank you to all those in, involved in helping to make that happen you know who you are um that's about it for me. You got anything else? Nothing else. All right. Well, you know what time it is, leapers, fellow travelers. Take care of yourselves. Take care of one another. Stay safe out there. And remember to always leap responsibly. Have a good week, Cal. <laughs>